Wonderful. It's good to see uh, that uh, you are uh, scattered around the globe, which is absolutely fantastic because I think we, we are addressing uh, an issue today that um, is of great concern for everyone everywhere. And um, therefore, I'm delighted that you spend your lunchtime or afternoon uh, or morning with me uh, or your late night uh, discussing um, this question or this statement, really, how to stay profitable in an age of uh, sustainability. And that gives a little bit uh, away where we are going. So there is this age of sustainability. There is no escaping. And uh, how can we uh, uh, still reconcile this with the challenge of uh, staying profitable? And that is what I want to discuss with you in the next couple of uh, uh, minutes. I have a couple of polls and I want to uh, uh, just right away uh, start, um, start off with, um, with this poll that uh, I, I like you to, to, um, to fill in. And um, it should be popping up uh, right now. And uh, it has a couple of questions, three questions. So please scroll down and just give me an indication of uh, what is the industry uh, there that you are in and um, where is your company's headquarter located? And um, what are you most interested in? Uh, what do you want to learn about? And the poll the results are coming in. This is great. This is really, really interesting. I end the poll and show you the results. So. Um, you, you see that uh, manufacturing and service is uh, uh, quite prominent, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, um, a bit of a surprise. I thought that financials might be uh, also prominent, uh, more prominent, but you're there. Extraction is uh, uh, not very strongly represented, uh, which is uh, uh, also interesting. Europe and Africa, well, uh, we have uh, sliced the world into three slices, the Americas, Europe and Africa, and uh, Asia, Oceania. So uh, uh, Europe and Africa is, is clearly also due to time uh, zone uh, represented very strongly. And uh, why are you here? I'm very happy that uh, you are at the right place. So uh, what I want to do is exactly delve into how do we both? How do we do both? How do we stay profitable and contribute to a sustainable world? This is uh, this is great. So let's uh, let's move. Uh, uh, ahead right away. And uh, when we talk about profitability, um, that's, um, that's sometimes not easy to answer. For what? Uh, I once did a study in one company uh, figuring out what they actually mean when they say profitability. And it was more than 20 different definitions of what profitability is, how it should be measured and so on. Imagine you have a table of executives around um, discussing um, strategy, investments, and every one of them has a different definition of profitability in mind. So I think that is the first issue that we need to address when we want to reconcile uh, the perceived uh, uh, challenge uh, to do both, being profitable and sustainable. Um, clearly, there are multiple definitions uh, of this, and we don't need to go into this, but you need to make sure that your team knows what it is talking about when it says profitable, and you need to make sure that your team is on the same page when you talk about sustainability. And um, clearly, many of you uh, think like, oh, of course, uh, everyone uh, uh, must uh, uh, be caring about the water or poverty or inequality or uh, the pollution or plastics, microplastics. So very often things are on top of one's mind, but that doesn't mean that they're on top of everyone's mind who is sitting around the table, who are your dear colleagues, who you hang out a lot with. Uh, so we need to make sure that we get uh, onto the same page. What is very effective, I found, and I came out of the session with uh, uh, leaders from the UNDP yesterday, um, is the sustainability goal uh, uh, tableau. And uh, talking through with other executives uh, when we're addressing the sustainability, um, which of those matter for us most? Uh, of course, they all are important. What? which of those matter for us most uh, is the start of uh, uh, 
uh, building a consensus of where your organization wants to wants to push. And I think this is nothing new, but I wanted to put this down as an academic definitions, they matter. As practitioners, uh, they also matter for you and your effectiveness. So um, let's let's show what uh, I have uh, prepared for today. Um, I'll talk you through a couple of ifs, which are basically scenarios of uh, uh, different kinds of ways of addressing the challenge to reconcile profits and profitability, uh, sustainability, sorry. And uh, then I'll uh, uh, show how firms, how companies address this. Um, I share with you the challenges that I've observed and uh, uh, in the process, we'll reveal your challenges if you uh, participate. And then um, we'll move into three uh, uh, things to do based on a recent study um, that uh, we've uh, completed. Good, so if, if uh, profitability and uh, sustainability uh, need to be accomplished in the past, many firms and many executives were trying to make a choice in terms of a trade-off. So if we choose uh, profitability, then sustainability has to wait. Or if we choose sustainability, then uh, of course we cannot hand out uh, dividends to our shareholders. So it was perceived to be a stark choice between these two. And uh, that either or mentality is something that I think must be a matter of the past. And the fact that you are interested in learning about both is fantastic because it shows that you are not thinking about uh, profitability as antagonistic to uh, sustainability, but you, try to bring them somehow together. And I think the, the new way of thinking that is uh, diffusing very quickly is this both end. How can we make these uh, work out together at the same time so that uh, our stakeholders are happy and among them also the shareholders? So um, that is, I think, um, the question that we try to answer. How do we do both together? Uh, how, how do we reconcile these? And uh, I have uh, a couple of things that I want to share with you. Uh, but first, uh, there's another poll. And um, I want you to uh, answer the question whether your organization uh, still thinks more in terms of versus, so in terms of a trade-off, or thinks about integration, addition, complementarity. So the poll is already racing very quickly. This is great. Um, very, very nice. So uh, go, yes. Okay, you're chasing. I'm very sorry that uh, I cannot uh, reveal the results before they are in, it's, but it's exciting to watch how, uh, how you're racing. There is no right or wrong answer here, right? It's just a matter of stating what is the case in our organizations. And uh, this may be an answer for you, uh, for the unit in the organization uh, that you are in or for the entire corporation. And I share the results. So um, this is really, really uh, encouraging. This is really, really encouraging. And what I want from you now is uh, that you share with your new friends from around the world. Uh, I would like you to, uh, to share what your most important way to reconcile profits and sustainability is. Put the keyword, not a novel, just the keyword in the chat. So give me a chat storm about how you integrate and combine these two uh, very difficult uh, to achieve uh, uh, partly contradictory goals, uh, as le at least uh, when it comes to the perception of some. So how do you do this? New business models. Andy, uh, thank you for this. This is, this is, this is a triple bottom line reporting, customer success. Circular economy, sell the more sustainable solution. Very nice. Consumer focus, regenerative growth, happy integrated business strategy. The culture, Thomas, very, very nice. And we have red lines. Okay. Our values are not for sale. Values, culture, 
Yes, sustainable value propositions. Long, focusing on the long-term opportunities. This is really, really good. Yes, really interesting. Client engagement. So uh, co-creating the solutions with the client, with the market. Frugal innovation, very, very nice. Yes, uh, I like frugal innovation, but I also like a, a synonym, uh, Gandhi engineering. This is very good. Mindset change, excellent. This is really, really good. I like that. Uh, you're my audience, but frankly, uh, you're also experts, which is absolutely fantastic. I love this. I love this. Let me just stop sharing the poll and, um, and move on. I'd like to um, move on by looking at, um, at how firms do this. And you already saw what is here in the room. And uh, um, I have only two solutions to offer. One is sequencing and one is mutualizing. And sequencing is um, pretty obvious. Um, it starts, for example, with uh, profitability. And uh, then firms try to uh, make themselves more sustainable. And this is, uh, this is not uncommon. Um, as you said in the responses, long-term and so on, um, the extent that you project your sustainability goals into the future matters a lot. So are you proclaiming that in 2050, everything will be okay? Or are you saying uh, we are doing this until the end of the year? So very, very different. Um, and then the focus of how you uh, translate profits that you made into sustainability can be, oh, sorry for the title, can be uh, more narrow or can be wider. And um, then, of course, there is this big uh, elephant in the room uh, that still many, many uh, uh, companies are saying nice things and donating a tree here or there, uh, but they are not really uh, engaging and working through, through the issue. So this is one way of sequ sequencing. And I think it's important. It's important to understand that we make a lot of money and then we start thinking about sustainability. So the logic here is, if we are profitable, well, then we have the time and resources to do something about sustainability. So if we are profitable, then we have uh, leisure enough to do something about sustainability. It's a very important logic, uh, and it applies uh, uh, maybe to many, uh, but it is not the only one. A completely different logic is um, we are sustainable because what we are doing is alleviating uh, uh, inequality. It's uh, uh, creating cleaner air and uh, uh, a, a more just society. It's uh, uh, promoting peace. And uh, now that we know that we can do this, let's figure out how we make money with this. That's a very different proposition. It's a very, very different logic than uh, going in the other way around, right? So uh, these sequences matter a lot. The first sequence was, let's first focus on money. And if we make enough money, then we start thinking about uh, the other thing. What was that again? Sustainability. And here we have a logic that says, well, let's first uh, create a business model that is sustainable, and uh, then we start thinking about monetizing this. Um, this is very important. This is very, very important for a couple of reasons. First, uh, the relevance of organizations matters a lot. So if the younger generations uh, do not uh, see you as an, a relevant employer anymore because uh, you are not sustainable, then uh, this undermines uh, everything you do, even if you only focus on profitability. So the relevance, staying relevant uh, is, is important. And for that, you need to get the sustainability first in order to uh, monetize later. Um, differentiation. Uh, many firms can uh, differentiate uh, excessively uh, and then see how they uh, can monetize. And differentiation could be uh, a, a strong emphasis on sustainability. That doesn't have to be profitable from the start, but over time, it should develop into something that is also financially sustainable. And then, of course, the development of new products and services. Let me give you a couple of uh, examples for this. Um, but before, I want to know 
uh, where you are. Okay, so here's the poll. And um, I have to just open the poll to understand what your organization's direction is. So do you go from profit first and sustainability second? Or do you go from sustainability first and uh, monetization later? Make your choice. I know it's, it's forcing you into making a choice, this or that. And I have not given you the both option uh, of which we all know after what you've shown me in the chat uh, that uh, you are interested in both. But I'm forcing you to uh, make a choice for your organization. If you objectively look at uh, your organization, would it uh, go from profits to sustainability or from sustainability to profits? So uh, with this forced choice, I now uh, end the poll and uh, share the results. So, um, okay, so you're also sharing uh, uh, in the chat. This is absolutely fantastic. This is great. It depends. Yes, I. Uh, this is uh, this is very. <laughs> It depends on the context. Absolutely, Bogdan. It's, uh, it, it very much depends on the business model. It depends on the context. Yes. Let's see how honest we are. Uh, Fevzi, I love this. I love this. It's a very, very good comment. I think this is great. And I think the results that you are seeing shows that you're very honest. Um, because um, many organizations are older than 20 years and uh, only in the last two decades, this topic of sustainability has become uh, relevant for uh, the broader majority of, in our society, unfortunately. Um, so great, uh, very, very good, this is good. Um, I would love to have from those that have chosen uh, the second option from sustainability to uh, profitability later, um, can you give us in short keywords in the chat an idea of what you're doing? Ah, okay. Sign Global Compound Act, okay. Tobacco, so um, I'm not sure how to interpret this. So are you moving away from this or are you moving into strategic advice to law firms? Interesting, green finance. Paying living wage, that's very good. Nadine, thank you. This is very, very concrete, a very uh, specific action. And, uh, and then you see later, yes, that's very, very nice. It's good, it's good. So, uh, ah, suddenly, suddenly you're, you're, you're agile, yes. Health promotion, making sure that your uh, employees uh, and uh, um, all your, your suppliers may be in partners, stay healthy. This is very, very farming, health, uh, healthy plant-based uh, ingredients. Yes, under SDG role. So you're working with the SDGs, great. Launching new ventures, okay. Education, very, very good. Moving away beyond tobacco. Thanks, uh, Yashin, for this. That's great. Thank you for the clarification. Recycling, ex exploring recycling options. Okay, let's explore this first and later figure out how we can make this uh, financially sustainable. Very, very good. This is good stuff. Thanks, Stan, also for business finance. I stopped sharing and uh, then I would like to uh, uh, move, uh, move on and... Um, hopefully engage uh, uh, in a little bit more of a discussion with you uh, in a bit. So why is this relevant? Why is this important uh, to consider doing something that uh, is sustainable um, at uh, this point in time? Uh, of course, we know about the global predicament, uh, the grand challenges. We know about uh, uh, climate change issues, and we know about uh, an invasion in uh, Ukraine. Uh, so there are many, many challenges. Uh, and um, we also see that in the workforce, after two years of COVID, uh, the great resignation uh, is a fact. So why do people leave? Because uh, they don't see relevance and meaning in their jobs. And so uh, giving them relevance and meaning by doing something meaningful and relevant for the world is the way forward there. Uh, if we look at the Fortune poll, uh, here, um, what uh, are the external issues that CEOs uh, 
uh, find uh, uh, challenging uh, as a last year's poll. So, uh, but the uh, period is uh, still uh, uh, what uh, we are living right uh, through now. Labor and skills shortages at the top of the agenda. So it's not COVID, it's not the pandemic, but it's labor and skills shortages. Yesterday, I was with the CEO of a robotics firm and he emphasized that it's people, people, people. They're growing like crazy, but the constraint is finding the right people. So um, what actions have uh, been taken uh, to strengthen the ability to uh, attract and retain talent? So I think that's where, where we, we can uh, uh, immediately relate to uh, making sure that our employees are healthy, uh, increased flexibility, more emphasis on, on the purpose. Um, the more emphasis on the purpose here is, uh, is a very, very uh, uh, pertinent issue. Uh, sustainability provides us with the purpose that uh, uh, not only we, but also younger generations uh, buy into very, very voluntarily. And so um, I don't know whether you are uh, uh, into fashion. I uh, make this short for those who are not uh, in manufacturing and services. Uh, Stella McCartney is, yes, uh, uh, the daughter of uh, but she's also a successful fashion designer who emphasizes uh, sustainability in uh, the materials that she uses and so on. And fashion, of course, even with that, still uh, poses uh, some uh, uh, great, great uh, uh, issues. But let me uh, pursue this uh, notion of sustainability in fashion a little bit more. Uh, Chloe is another firm that has uh, recently, Chloe, by the way, is the place where Stella McCartney started. And um, uh, Chloe has uh, also emphasized uh, the uh, sustainability angle to a great extent and uh, in very interesting ways. So uh, as the first uh, fashion brand, they have applied to get a, a B Corp uh, certification so that uh, everything this brand does is uh, certified by uh, an organization that asks them loads of questions and checks uh, whether everything is all right. That's uh, not the perfect solution, but it is uh, certainly a great step forward in making uh, fashion supply chain and uh, fashion's products uh, more sustainable. But what I find very, very interesting is uh, that um, they are also uh, working together with uh, Bas Timmermans, uh, a designer from uh, the Netherlands, and uh, he has uh, developed the shelter suit, the shelter suit. And the shelter suit is uh, kind of a, a sleeping bag that you can wear. It's a, it's a nice wearable sleeping bag uh, uh, that, uh, that also uh, gives you warmth as clothing. And that is uh, uh, needed if you have to stay on the street. Uh, if you're sleeping on the street, if you don't have home and shelter, then uh, um, harsh climates are really harsh. And uh, that's where Bas uh, wanted to help and, uh, uh, and has with donations over the years supported many uh, who ended up uh, um, without shelter um, by providing them with shelter suits. And uh, he's now exploring different ways of uh, how to, how to uh, make more money besides the donations so that his activity that uh, supports people who have fallen on hard times can be helped even more. And I think this is a very interesting example. And the link to Chloe is that uh, he, for example, now has, uh, or Shelter Suit has now uh, uh, teamed up with Chloe. And so uh, the large corporate brand is uh, working together with, um, with uh, a very, very, uh, mm, you could say subversive brand because they are started from uh, sustainability first uh, and, uh, and are now uh, hoping to increase their leverage by monetizing faster for more shelter suits. Good. So um, mutualizing. Um, you have had a question. Did those action... Uh, did those action work from the action you mentioned to retain people? I'm, Avinash, I'm not so sure whether I understand the question. Um, uh, Sagrario, the seven R's, you, I think you need to explain this. Um, okay. 
Good. So um, when you have questions, I once in a while look at them. I have a screen here that displays them in a, big, a bigger font. Um, if I don't catch uh, them, uh, just uh, post them repeatedly and uh, eventually I'll, uh, I'll find it. Good. So let's have a look at mutualizing. So uh, the solution to bringing um, profits and sustainability, profitability and sustainability together uh, has two elements. One is sequencing. You can come from here or you can come from there. We have established that many of you start from the profitability and are moving into sustainability. Um, and uh, mutualizing is something that I find is most interesting. And uh, that is why you're here for. You wanted to learn about both. And uh, so that's, I think, uh, the visualization of where we're going to. Just adding things up uh, is not really enough. Uh, I think we need to uh, go beyond, we, get, we need to develop a model where we have a multiplier effect, where the profits help us to become even more sustainable. The sustainability becomes a, becomes a, a leverage for uh, generating even more funds so that we can, and so you see the logic of this uh, uh, green cycle. And uh, I think that's uh, uh, something that I, I'm, I'm really fascinated with. And as you saw uh, with the uh, example that I just gave, um, we, we need to explore this a little bit. What are the challenges with this? The challenges, of course, is uh, uh, hidden uh, by the beautiful green arrows. Um, there are challenges on this side and there are challenges on the other side. So there is a lot of uh, issues that make it hard to uh, switch from a mindset, as you mentioned, that is focused on profits, profitability, um, to a sustainability mindset. And uh, uh, some of this relates to people, people being the employees. Um, for uh, employees who have uh, for decades done one thing, telling them that they now also need to do the other thing uh, is challenging. Uh, for consumers who have been trained to uh, look at specific elements of an offering, uh, now to also understand uh, the sustainability impl implications of their own consumption, that is, that is, uh, uh, is hard. That is hard. Okay, um, resources. Um, I come to a, a couple of concrete examples in, in a bit. Just uh, uh, give me time, Virginia. Um, so uh, resources, uh, very often uh, the resources seem to be lacking. So these uh, resources could be money because um, uh, the profits uh, uh, are reinvested or are uh, um, handed over to uh, uh, the legitimate owners of uh, uh, an enterprise. So uh, it may be um, other things than uh, uh, money only. I just mentioned the scarcity of, of people who have an understanding of how to make this uh, uh, synergistic cycle uh, flow. And uh, finding these people, uh, if you have never had anything to do with sustainability and convincing that their time is best spent with you trying to help you to uh, uh, get into this uh, um, green spiral. That is uh, that is hard. So uh, the talent uh, is is uh, another issue. Routines. You have established routines, and it's very very difficult to change your supply chain. It's very very difficult to change uh, um, how you uh, produce, how you procure, where your plants are, uh, and um, how your uh, logistic system is set up. So uh, not to speak of. Um, the old legacy uh, ICT systems that uh, embed certain routines of working uh, that may be very carbon intensive and, and you uh, or lead to a high carbon footprint for you. Um, and it's, it's hard to, to change our routines. It's very difficult to uh, um, uh, quit smoking or uh, start exercising. And it's very, very hard to get rid of the um, negative, um, not sustainable routines in an organization. It takes a very long time to get rid of paper. We have been promised uh, by, uh, uh, by many uh, pundits uh, decades ago that we would have the paperless office and we are getting closer, we're getting closer, but it's still uh, uh, hard to change routines. The resolve. The resolve of uh, leadership to, uh, to actually do something uh, that uh, gets us into this green spiral. And um, that has multiple um, reasons, multiple uh, um, 
explanations and um, uh, one of course is training and uh, an understanding of the complexity of things so uh, sustainability is becoming a bit of a science in itself uh, but another thing is also um, that it is very hard to show uh, in a quarter uh, results uh, when it comes to long-term goals so the short-termism is uh, is uh, a, a challenge tech we don't have the right technology for some organizations, it's really hard because what they're doing uh, requires them to use specific technologies that are not necessarily uh, sustainable. So uh, uh, finding solutions there is a challenge, and that's what we are listing here. These are the challenges. Um, developing new applications uh, that are sustainable. Um, these can be software applications, but these can be also applications uh, that uh, organizational applications. Uh, the skills and capabilities. So uh, um, how can we retrain our sales force so that they really understand the benefits uh, that we are, as you suggested earlier, uh, that we are now emphasizing. So the sales force need, needs to understand that it is our company's purpose uh, to suggest the more sustainable version, sometimes even over the more profitable version. So this is, uh, this is hard reskilling. And then uh, processes, company processes, um, I find uh, are in the way very, very often. Now, let me um, address a couple of the comments that you've uh, uh, mentioned and the questions uh, that you've shared in the chat. And, um, and, and then I'll go uh, and address the, uh, the next uh, segment. But before we uh, go into the next segment, let me take another poll. And I want to uh, learn from you what your challenges are. So I've listed the challenges that you've just seen. And um, I launched the poll. And you have now multiple choice. So you could say people and, process, uh, people and skills capabilities may be a little bit uh, overlapping. I intended uh, the skills and capabilities to be more on the organizational skills and capabilities side. Uh, Tan, yes, uh, this uh, matches exactly what, uh, uh, what you're concerned uh, with. So one thing that uh, is obviously clear is um, every challenge matters to you. So uh, to different extent, but I find that uh, uh, that highlights uh, how hard this actually is for organizations to uh, get onto this green spiral. And um, I think that people, resources, skills, and processes are uh, uh, the top contenders followed immediately by uh, technology and routines. I think this is really, uh, really good. Both soft and hard. Yes, McKinsey uh, 7S, yes, okay. The Hard and soft ones, absolutely. It's, it's yes, it, uh, risks and opportunities, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, my takeaway from, from this little poll is that you are severely challenged because it's coming at you from all sides and focusing on one thing only will not do. So uh, this, is, uh, this is good. And um, uh, it's good to, to acknowledge this and be aware of this. For each of uh, you, I would suggest that you sit around with your colleagues and discuss in the top uh, leadership team uh, what you want to focus on and what the key issues are for you. So, great. Let me just uh, go back to uh, your questions that you had. I don't want to um, uh, skip over uh, important things. FESV, yes, the flywheel needs to uh, spin, yeah. Um, I will, um, Virginia, I'll come to the uh, examples right away. Whole making sustainability sustainable is a challenge because the short-term pressure for profitability is, uh, is there. And I think you're raising a very, very important point. Um, and uh, you may be on the right path, but because of external pressures, uh, they may force you to uh, abandon sustainability efforts. And... Just to answer this briefly, what we find very often is that uh, firms that are not listed, um, for example, family-owned firms, uh, have it easier to resist these external pressures because they can follow their purpose in un uh, unencumbered by uh, uh, analysts asking them for more profits all the time. It's uh, Avinash, this is good. Uh, all these actions, increasing wages, uh, does this in the end uh, help to retain uh, talent? Does it, uh, um, does flexibility or, or um, greater uh, care for um, the health of employees uh, 
work out in the end, that is uh, a, oftentimes a leap of faith when you come from the sustainability uh, angle and you uh, want to monetize later, it is a leap of faith. Uh, but I know from uh, a friend who is a CEO in, um, in textile, not fashion, but textile, uh, that uh, uh, their care of uh, uh, their employees in the first waves um, led to an outpouring of support of the company uh, when uh, uh, things economically uh, became a little bit more difficult later on. So, uh, but this is anecdotal evidence and uh, there is uh, um, research that supports um, taking the leap of faith can be very beneficial. Uh, COVID accelerated a lot of things and staying, uh, staying afloat is, uh, yes, yeah, staying surviving is, is, uh, is, is for many, uh, uh, is for all critical. And for that, you need people, you need engaged people, you need people who stick with you uh, through thick and uh, thin, and uh, their uh, sustainability efforts can really make the difference. Partnerships, very, very important topic. This is absolutely fantastic. Your challenges resonate 100% with our client. Therefore, starting with them, ESG ventures and incubators. Very nice. I like that a lot, Eric. Uh, new financial models. Very, very interesting. Yes. Um, and I think I, yes. Shouldn't we include leadership instead of people? Um, yeah. Uh, I think we, 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 can, we can include uh, people in the leadership bucket, if you like. I had uh, uh, put leadership under resolve, uh, but uh, I think that is, um, that is something that maybe, Maurice, for your company, needs to be done uh, company-specific. We also want to challenge. Um, uh, who do you want to challenge, Martina? I'm not so sure uh, whether I get this. Partnerships is a very, very good one. Um, the external context, the, uh, the reaching out bit, I didn't cover in this. Absolutely. This is a very good uh, point, Helga. Excellent. Um, it's Justin, I was uh, about to say this. You, you have uh, resolve uh, as being uh, very, very low. And um, so th that is a positive sign if, if your leadership is uh, clearly behind um, emphasizing sustainability and seeing how to uh, get the return on this investment back later, that is, uh, that is fortunate. So you are amongst the fortunate. Absolutely. Good, good point, Justin. Uh, the organization seems to have the result, but lack infrastructure. Yes, Patricia. And this now everyone is scrambling to get the infrastructure for uh, sustaining sustainability in place. And uh, that uh, it, is creating a huge demand for uh, priced assets. Very, very nice. I love your comments. This is all very, very good. Uh, sustainability costs should be measured the same way as advertising behind. Very interesting. I'll have uh, something for you, uh, Shobinder, in, uh, in a minute. Um, very, very good. Did you Excellent. Lots of great comments. I, I hope you enjoy going through them like I do. This is very, very good. Okay. So um, let, me, uh, let me continue because uh, um, bearing in mind that uh, our time is limited, unfortunately, um, and uh, let's, let's move ahead. What, what, what can we do? What can we, what can we do? Um, together with, with colleagues in Sweden, uh, Joachim Netz and, um, and uh, um, uh, Matthias Axelsson, we, we've done a study um, that uh, I think is quite interesting and provides a, a peek into uh, what I want to uh, talk about. And I want to uh, encourage you to do three things, to do three things. One is consider sensitivity. Another one is consider suspension and then uh, focus on models of innovation. So let me go through these in turn and illustrate them with cases of, uh, of, of companies. So um, when we did this study, we found that uh, in response to COVID, which clearly a pandemic is a grand challenge, right? Um, we found that firms differed very much in the way they acted to help society with the pandemic. And one thing that uh, struck us 
was that firms are differently sensitive to what's going on in their environment. And we know this from strategy for a very long time that the external analysis, all my students, they, they may remember the external analysis makes a lot of a difference for the success of a firm. But what struck us was how sensitive firms were to requests that had absolutely nothing to do with their business. So they were responding to calls from hospitals. We know that you're manufacturing stuff in plastic. Can you, can you help us and manufacture something for uh, what we are lacking in the hospital? And the companies had never dealt with hospitals, had never dealt with uh, these kinds of requests. And usually in the corporate world, what do you do with this? You brush this off. This has nothing to do with you. That's for someone else to pick up. That's not who you are. So what we found was that firms who were more sensitive to the real needs of the society, even if completely unrelated to what the firm was about, the firm was more likely to help with the pandemic. And so uh, what, what I find is interesting is the degree to which firms internalize these uh, odd requests that, uh, that have nothing to do with, uh, with them. Um, getting uh, um, um, Absolute Vodka and uh, Lantaman and, and all, all these companies that, that reacted somehow to the crisis reacted differently when they were able to internalize these odd requests, when they were able to make this need in society present within. And um, here at IND, I think for us, um, of course, for all of us, uh, when a war breaks out, wherever, uh, in the Americas, in Asia, or in uh, Africa, it's, uh, it's a disaster. Um, and um, for us here at IMD, I think uh, it also makes a difference to know that uh, some of our colleagues have relatives spending their nights in shelters. So companies that are uh, fortunate enough uh, to be in touch uh, uh, this way uh, with the real needs of societies have an advantage to internalize the emerging needs of a society and react to them. Um, companies that have the luck to have somehow present um, a link to the needs outside in society um, have an advantage in uh, developing greater sensitivity. And the um, flip side of this, of course, is make sure that you have internalized in your organization enough diversity and variety so that you are reflecting uh, the beauty of the world, but also the problems of the world because that makes you more sensitive to what is going on outside and what is really relevant to uh, customers, consumers, partners, and all the other stakeholders that uh, are waiting that you help them. Uh, one of the old cases, of course, is uh, Walmart hel helping during uh, the Katrina disaster, but we have uh, seen in many uh, contexts uh, recently uh, that uh, uh, breweries that uh, 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 luxury goods manufacturers have uh, overnight switched their manufacturing and dedicated them, repurposed them for uh, making uh, hand sanitizers or other, other goods that we needed, masks, uh, uh, protection gear, um, um, uh, syringes, and so on for, for uh, ventilators for, um, for the urgent need of society. So, in a nutshell, corporate sensitivity has all about uh, has all about uh, uh, has to do about two things. One is uh, identifying what really needs to be done, 
and uh, then uh, identifying, repurposing what can be done with the existing resources that you have. Uh, you are in organizations that are very, very successful. So, um, and uh, that endows you with infrastructure that can be repurposed for the good. And um, just to give you um, um, an idea of suspension, um, when you repurpose, when you repurpose, um, very often you need to um, reconsider why you're doing things and um, whether uh, this purpose is in tune with the times. So we found in our research that firms consciously, profit-oriented firms, consciously suspended their profit orientation. Of course, in the crisis, uh, they do this uh, uh, hoping that the crisis will go away and then they can go back to normal. But the idea of suspending profit orientation for a while is a very, very interesting one because it shows that you are concerned, that you are doing something about society and sustainability, and uh, it gives you time to reflect while you're doing a good thing. So uh, uh, suspending uh, what product uh, and market areas you have been concerned with in the past and considering new ones, suspending uh, your preconceived notions, what your operational supply chain can do or cannot do, and uh, who is uh, uh, going to lead this. Because very, very often, it's not the hierarchically predisposed people in the positions who lead sustainability efforts, but it is those who are most passionate about the issues. And uh, in that sense, it is uh, uh, necessary to suspend the beliefs of um, organizations about how hierarchy works. Very often, hierarchy works best when it's temporary. Good. So uh, let me uh, share, you, share with you an example of, uh, of what we have uh, um, been discussing. We talked about Katrina's uh, um, uh, disaster many years ago and um, how Walmart provided the necessary infrastructure. Uh, one of uh, IMD's uh, EMBAs is, uh, okay, he's not the CEO of uh, a company that is uh, so massive as, as Walmart. But uh, he is providing with his supermarket uh, um, uh, a lifeline, an infrastructure for, uh, for the Ukrainian people so that they can get the things they need to survive. So um, let me close with a couple of uh, models of innovation and cases here. Um, one of those models of innovation, um, a company that uh, has chosen to uh, do something about uh, carbon emissions by sucking it out of the air. So Climeworks is a Swiss startup that is hugely successful. And their attempt is to help the world with CO2 by taking it out of the atmosphere. There's too much in it, so that's their solution. And you see that this whole business model, the whole idea is firmly rooted in sustainability. Firmly, the idea makes only sense when you are uh, uh, in uh, the world of sustainability and uh, how, to de how to make money from this uh, is uh, uh, clearly uh, something that comes later. And uh, the, um, the global arrangements with uh, carbon credits is, of course, of enormous help. And um, I promised uh, one of you that I would come with an example that is very, very uh, close to what you were suggesting. Uh, Doconomy, I think, is an interesting startup, and it, it so happens um, that it's a Swedish startup. Uh, and they uh, offer in the financial world uh, a solution that is uh, uh, tightly related to sustainability. So when you, are with your um, Pay, payment card, make purchases in supermarkets. Um, all these uh, payments, they will uh, reflect in your bank account. And um, when you, uh, yesterday I drove a car, please forgive me, um, and uh, I refueled it and uh, I paid with my uh, card uh, for uh, this at the gasoline station. Um, this will uh, be reflected in uh, the bank. And uh, the economy 
uh, is uh, calculating the carbon footprint based on all the expenses that I make um, um, as I go through my life. And I find that a very, very interesting uh, uh, way of uh, showing me, the consumer, uh, my uh, uh, impact on, uh, on, um, on climate. And uh, the lifestyle impact, uh, uh, the transaction impacts, the impact of corporations and products can thus be calculated. Of course, this is not a perfect, uh, um, perfect calculation, but it is very close. Um, and uh, it helps us to visualize the uh, uh, environmental impact that we have by living and consuming the way we, we do. And uh, this is a startup. So in terms of uh, your questions, show me examples of companies that have reacted to a, an issue that has um, exploded in the last two decades. Uh, show me examples of companies that are uh, uh, successful over a very, very long time doing this is a bit hard. So uh, admittedly, this is, a, uh, this is a startup. Uh, but we see that, uh, for example, in VV, Nestle is uh, investing heavily in, um, in products that uh, no longer emphasize uh, um, the um, emphasize animal, uh, uh, animal meat. And uh, so this is a very, very uh, new product line. Um, vegan um, product lines are also uh, kind of uh, edging towards that way. Uh, new developments in uh, uh, sustainable packaging uh, are uh, underway. And uh, even there, um, solutions such as Doconomy um, can uh, differentiate whether I buy things in a supermarket where every single apple is plastic wrapped or whether I go to uh, a farmer's market uh, and bring my own Bag. Eric, thanks a lot for the Fairphone uh, example. This is a very, very good case. A friend of mine has, uh, uh, has written uh, the case study on Fairphone, uh, self-repair, uh, self -repair, conflict-free sourcing. Yes, absolutely. And there again, um, there are so many encouraging startups or small firms that do a good thing and later monetize. So uh, they don't get uh, yet so much attention from the world's uh, uh, investors uh, because uh, they are relatively small yet. Uh, but there are larger firms that uh, have uh, um, turned the wheel as well. So uh, let me uh, show you one example that uh, uh, we are currently working on um, in terms of a case study, that is uh, Stellabs, it's a, a, a startup again uh, from India. And uh, Stellabs is uh, trying to improve cattle productivity and herd performance uh, with high tech. So uh, they put wearables and, uh, uh, on cows uh, in order to uh, measure their health and uh, uh, any issues uh, to uh, measure productivity. And uh, they uh, apply uh, high-tech AI to understand and optimize for each single farmer's uh, cow what needs to be done. And thereby help the farmers uh, to earn a better living and help to avoid waste in the system. So I think this is a very interesting uh, large-scale um, attempt to optimize uh, the economic use of resources for uh, a better, sus more sustainable uh, way of um, uh, cattle herding and, uh, um, and, uh, and, and milk production. So uh, with this, I have only three minutes uh, left. And uh, given that this is Switzerland, I'm really apologetic for the fact that we have to uh, finish on time. Let me just uh, go back through uh, your uh, great comments here so that I make sure that I, I didn't forget to comment on. NPV calculation, yes, interesting, needs to be done, but uh, never forget that most of this uh, are assumptions that you put into the system. Uh, often it is forgotten when then the number is there, people forget the assumptions behind it. Um, yes, when pandemic, when when companies reacted to odd requests, um, 
Yes. How long? Excellent, uh, Justin. This is a very, very good. Uh, um, this is a very, very good question. So, when companies uh, help out in an emergency or in a crisis, or when there is a flooding caused by climate climate change or so, uh, how long can companies sustain this uh, this uh, reaching out and uh, helping? Um, before they uh, um, lose too much cash? Uh, I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, question. And um, right now in the academic world and also in the world of practitioners, we still see climate change here and crisis there. And uh, as long as uh, we don't uh, perceive the urgency, uh, then we don't have an overlap and people will not react against climate change in the same way they react uh, to a crisis. But I think this is uh, changing. I think this is changing with uh, more and more extreme weather events, for example. And um, how can we react now with the war uh, to be more sensitive? Uh, yesterday, Paula, I uh, was uh, uh, at a company uh, in in Europe, and they were uh, receiving refugees from uh, from Ukraine. So uh, uh, these are things how companies can uh, show themselves to be citizens in the communities that they are in, and uh, uh, they can show themselves to be uh, uh, citizens of the greater region they are in, whether this is Europe, Asia or uh, Africa, or uh, the Americas, uh, these are small steps uh, that uh, can, to, uh, can save lives. It's interesting to uh, um, uh, bring up the, the materiality uh, issue, Helga. Um, we can uh, frame this uh, sensitivity to short-term short requests uh, in, uh, in opposition to uh, long-term goals, absolutely. Um, but uh, I think... Um, that is um, that is a very very important question. It's a very very important question, and uh, I don't answer this in the last minute. It's a it's a deeply uh, human uh, question that I think we all need to grapple with. Can we refuse someone uh, in imminent danger because we have a long term betterment of the world in mind? Very very profound question, Helga. Thank you. Um, Marco, repurpose or emergency led, a bit of both, a bit of both, a bit of both. Um, okay, I think I, I got most of this. Um, I, uh, I have nothing but uh, to thank you and give you a summary of uh, uh, what I uh, wanted to share with you. I think we need to uh, go beyond, we need to think in terms of multiplication and synergies. And uh, I also think uh, that, we, that we need to stay in touch. Okay, so uh, with this, uh, I wish you a wonderful uh, uh, night, afternoon, uh, or morning, and uh, I hope to uh, one day see you uh, in person. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Thank you.